Yo, what's up, guys? GM, 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 GM. Chad, cow. GM, Chad, I, uh, Chad, 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 cow. <laughs> we need a second cow, I think. Two cows, two ca- two Chads. There's, there's a couple cows yeah. out there. <laughs> really? Any Thor cows? No, I'm, I'm not. I've seen. So much needs to create like a mid journey picture of like a cow with a rune logo on its side, and that's that's for, for another cow right there. We're still waiting on that theme song. Where's that? Oh yeah, the barbershop quartet rune tune. <laughs> I thought that was Chad's job. Yeah, it was supposed to be my job, but you know, building two protocols in a podcast and being a husband and a father is kind of time consuming. It's hard to find find free time for for nonsense projects. Yeah, this doesn't sound nearly as important as the, the theme song. Yeah, I don't know. I just hear excuses. I'm just kidding. How's everything going? I, I've actually I've actually been away. I just got back uh, today, so just been catching up on everything and listening to the uh, lending stage and, and everything. Getting just resynced up. So I, I'm not really sure if there's been anything major that's been going on. It seems like it's been pretty quiet, but we're getting ready to get ready to launch lending. Yeah, I think, I think the two big things that's going on, or actually three things I should say, is um, first one is launching Binance Smart Chain, and there's currently a community vote going on to to go ahead with uh, Binance Smart Chain or not. And then the next thing would be like lending, which is a big topic, obviously. And then the next thing is um, there's going to be a proposal in version 11, 111, uh, to change the um, how savers, how it calculates saver yield and how it generates saver yield uh, um, to reduce the yield effectively. And so that's, those are three interesting kind of current topics. Got it. I didn't think I saw. I didn't think I see the, saw the entire thing around uh, savers. Like I, I know there's been discussion of, like ever since we've you know been adding POL. It's up to like eleven and a half percent of the the total liquidity of the Bitcoin pool, which is actually just like crazy by itself. But uh, yeah, no, I, I've I've seen there's been some discussion. Is there any like firm uh, plan about the, about that entire thing? Like like what is the mechanism? And like is there going to be a vote or just how is all that going to work? Yeah, so there's a specific um, code change that was that's in, in 111 that's like coming out probably like today or maybe tomorrow um, for adoption, and then after that it gets adopted, it'll be like a vote on it. But the specific the specific change is this: it's very similar right, right now. The saber yield is basically like a hard fifty percent. So if you put in thousand dollars, you basically get yield on five hundred dollars of that, right? So you get half of your yield. And it's like a static number. The reason why it was a static number to begin with was just to create, have the savers product be just very simple to understand, right? It's not a lot of, you don't have to think about IL, you don't have to think about like multiple asset exposure, you don't have to think about, you know, flexible yield, you know, flexing in one direction or the other. Like, it's just very clean, very simple, right? Not much cognitive load to understand it. And then hopefully I would gardener more people to get into it in a matter of speaking. And so the the problem now is that savers has been a very successful kind of feature, so much so that we are like nearing the cap of what the network can support for, for from an economic security perspective. And once it hits that cap, PEL is no longer able to, you know, deploy more room in the pool because we've already hit the TVL cap, right? The hard cap of, of the network itself. So then it becomes like, well, what's stopping the savers from growing or synthetic more accurately growing from 50% to 55% to 60% to more? Well, you can't mint more since that's true, right? The network won't allow you to mint more since uh, once it gets to 60% utilization. But after that point, you know, um, if people, if the asset, the synth asset were to grow in value relative to room, like the, we grow beyond that 50%, of course, 55 and 70 and so forth and so on, it's theoretically possible. So the intention is, or is like, well, how do we kind of curve the yield that a saver makes to, you know, trend downward when we get closer to like hitting the cap or 
or, or the 50% marker or 60% marker or whatever it's going to be. And so the proposal that's being uh, thrown at the, the community to, to kind of discuss and debate and, you know, argue about uh, is should we kind of adopt what Maya is doing on their savers thing, which is basically a, a flexible yield. I think for Maya's case, they start at 80%. Uh, income instead of 50 and then it trends down I think like the lowest is 20 I want to say or maybe it's zero I can't really quite remember the top of my head but like um, the one that as the code is written now the proposal would be to my knowledge is that uh, it would start at 50 percent right and then it would trend to basically zero the closer we get to um, probably 50 percent utilization uh, uh, sensibilization. So like that would be the, the proposal the community would have to discuss and argue about. But basically every saver would basically get, would never get the yield they get today because as soon as one saver is in, in the pool, it's now less than 50% and it just kind of goes downward with the, with more adoption as it goes. So essentially it just takes that. So, so right now, like basically half the yield is given to savers. It just changes the amount that is sectioned off between the regular liquidity providers and to savers based on how much synth utilization there is in that pool. So if we're at, if we're at the caps, then it's, it's close to zero or zero. And then if it's low synth utilization in that pool, it may receive a higher percentage of the, the total yield. Right. Definitely like the winner in this scenario is definitely the LPs. Like the LPs will just make more money if, if this thing is approved and, and adopted. Um, those are, they're definitely the winners. Like they would make, you know, money from this, from the scenario. The losers of course would be the savers because they're always going to make less money than they've been making so far. Even in low sense utilization, they'd still make less money than they're making now. Um, so that's kind of, kind of a thing to discuss. So what brought this up? Like, is it just kind of feeling like savers are getting a bit too much free lunch and like kind of just to make it more fair for LPs? Is, is that like basically what started this conversation? Yeah, what started the conversation was like, we launched the savers product, um, uh, you know, a few months ago, it was six months ago, something like this. And we wanted to like kind of give people like kind of the most appetizing deal we can reasonably give them, right, without going overboard uh and and that was been you know that's why we've seen a pretty good uh, adoption of savers like you know in in our in our pools and so forth and so on and so we don't want to get to a point where like if we have too much sense in the network it overexposes lps to the to, to the rune asset right like and i think the the kind of the max number in my my, my mind is i really don't want to go above 50 percent. like we can go 60 and I, I wouldn't i wouldn't like freak out or panic or anything like this but like I think from my, in my mind personally, like 50% is probably like a good number and we want to keep it at that number and not go beyond it. If we go to that number, we're perfectly fine. There's nothing to worry about. You know, we're at the optimal, and to my mind, we, I look at that as like the optimal balance, right? Is at 50% because that means we have the um, more depth in the pools, more liquidity in the pool, which is great, which causes less uh, fees, swap fees, more trade volume. Like, oh, that's, that's a natural thing to occur with more depth to the pools. And that's a good thing. Once you get be over that 50%, well, now, like, you're not really um, contributing to the TVL very much anymore. Like, technically you are, but, like, it's, it's not necessarily good for the protocol. You're, you're now taking on more risk than benefit, in my mind. And so what, what started the whole conversation was, like, I opened up an issue and floated an idea to the community uh, last week, I think it was, or maybe the week before, but I think it was last week, well, of the idea of like negative interest rates, right? And so once we get beyond the 50% marker, that the interest rate goes from 50% interest rates to you know negative 0.01%, and it grows more intensely with the more beyond 50% we go. Right. As a way of like saying like, you know, 50% is like the, is the optimal place. Right. And if we go beyond that number, we want to start creating kind of pressure or, or kickback, you know, pressure back to, to push it back down 50% from the savers or the holders perspective. Right. And because uh, arbitrage bots, they don't take yields no matter what, either up or down, they're not affected by this whole thing. It's only the savers that get affected by this concept. So it, anyway, so we had this kind of debate in the community, which it seemed like the idea was, you know, largely was, wasn't passed or people wasn't a lot, a lot of support for it. So then people started talking about like, well, why don't we just do zero interest percent interest rates instead of negative interest rates, right? And uh, from my perspective, this means that like I, I 
that I don't think 0% interest rates will be effective in, in accomplishing the goal we're trying to accomplish in this thing, just because most savers are just like, you know, they kind of set it and forget it. They're not actively managing the position. They're not looking at their yield. They're just kind of like sitting there waiting for, um, you know, money to come over a long period of time. Um, but th that was kind of the discussion. And then from that, the uh, there was a, a post in that thread about like, let's just do a, like, you know, something similar to Maya effectively, where we're just kind of turning down, uh, turn, uh, level, leveling down the income for savers as they grow in, in terms of their size in the pool. Uh, and that's, that's, that's basically where we are, are now. And so once we launch version 111, there'll, there'll be some sort of community vote to adopt or not adopt uh, this idea. Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, the, the the whole thing with like negative interest rate, yeah, I, I could see that just being totally a non-starter, just especially just because of everything that um, everything has been communicated to savers. It, like it's it, it was meant to be like this set and forget type thing where it's like, all right, you 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 put in your your Bitcoin or whatever, and you don't have to worry about your principal. It's uh, you know, that, that's just, that, that's locked in and you just, you're getting continuous yield. So like, I, I feel like introducing a negative interest rate would, you know, it, it would definitely upset a lot of, a lot of people. And even though that, uh, I mean, there, there might, might be other solutions too, but like going to a 0% interest rate, you might be right that it doesn't even, it doesn't necessarily solve the problem because it is like a set and forget, you know, type thing where people aren't like, uh, aren't going to be like managing their position on, uh, you know, like a short-term basis. Yeah, I think the the problem that I have is that like that argument that you're making, while a valid argument to be made, right? Like, well, we told savers this, and blah blah blah. We want to maintain that blah blah. blah. That's all true, and I, I'm totally on mm -hmm. board with that from a high perspective. The problem comes in being like, well, what is what is appropriate for the network? Let's, let's look at pragmatists. Let's look at this logically. Let's look at this like, how do we get make sure that the, the network itself is safe and you know uh, can't get into you know unhealthy states or something like this. And that's more important than like you know uh, promising savers you know never never get negative interest rates or whatever. Like that is uh, objectively so. I don't think anybody would disagree with me on that. Like that's more important than like whatever, you know, deal we give to savers, right? But that said, like, to be honest, like, I don't think negative interest rates would even necessarily even occur in practicality, right? Because like, once you go beyond that 50%, say you're at 50.01% or something like this, the, the burn rate or the negative interest rate at that point would be so infinitesimally small that it'd be like basically nothing, right? And it would just like burn down to 50%. Like it would, it would be very small amounts. It would just start like burning since and getting down. So we have very small effects or people would see we're, getting, we're nearing the 50% mark and some people would leave before we get to that point and therefore we don't get to that point. Do you know what I mean? And like, but 0% interest rates, like the problem with that is that if you say, hey, you're going to fit from 50% to 0%, now they have to make a choice of like, oh, okay, well, either I stay in here now and I wait until tomorrow because maybe tomorrow somebody's going to leave and we're going to be below 50%. I'm going to get my interest back, my 50% interest rate back. Or I pay money and I swap, I leave and I pay the fees to exit. And then I pay the fees again to re-enter, you know, tomorrow when somebody, you know, when the yield comes back or whatever the hell it is. And so like the interest rate, like um, there's more friction to staying, to, to leaving the pool than there is to stay in it. And that's partially why I don't, I'm not sure that zero percentage rates will be effective in accomplishing the goal that they're trying to accomplish just because you've spent six months in the pool getting yield, you know, let's call it a 3% yield, whatever the hell it is. And you're going to, maybe you're going to pay, you know, 2% or 3% to leave <laughs> because the swap fees will be high enough for you in that scenario that you just, you basically burn all the interest that you made over the last three months or six months, whatever it is. And then you'll have to burn it again the second time when you will like re-enter the pool tomorrow, which maybe you will just choose like, oh, you know what, I'm not even gonna, why am I gonna waste my time? I didn't even get an income, blah, blah, blah. Like, and that becomes an argument people have in their minds. Like, I think on paper, people get very scared about the idea of a negative rate, negative interest rate. Right. And I understand why like I, from a, from like a, just a surface level perspective, like I get why people are so reactive and why there's an immediate like kickback for the reasons that Kyle was just talking about. But like the reality on in practicality that have like very little effect in terms of actually 
creating negative interest rate on individuals, but also ensure that we that the network will always be, you know, in a safe and, and viable state, right? What I'm thinking in my mind, and I could be totally wrong about this, and if I am, I'd be happy if I was wrong about this, is that uh, is that the community just needs more proof or try out the idea of negative of a zero percent interest rates or whatever to see the response, right, and see what happens. And this is like this is like what I'm like kind of concerned about with this new proposal personally that like. It's not really the, its incentives are not aligned with the problem, right? Because the problem isn't the interest rates of savers. That's not the issue. Like the fact that we get fifty percent interest rate on savers is not the problem. The problem is it's too many cents. That's a different concept, right? And so, like, you're not trying to balance the quantity of cents in that scenario. You're trying to balance the quantity of cents relative to LPs, which is not actually gearing towards the problem at hand. It's gearing towards some other problem. So the inevitable result of that, in my mind, is that either this proposal, if it gets adopted, has basically no effect and doesn't solve the problem at all. And, and basically, like, very few people actually leave or it doesn't actually, you know, help us solve the, the actual problem we're trying to solve. Or it's in, in, as a, a kind of a undercutting way of doing it. Like, it's actually quite uh, undercorrecting the problem. It either does that or it has an overcorrecting problem where – you know, today you're making 50% on your, on your position. And then all of a sudden you're making, you know, you know, 0.1% and then people start leaving and then we're, we push it back up to 1% or, or 2% or whatever. And I just, it eventually grows to maybe let's just call it 15% or 20%, whatever the hell the, that, that, that market will determine that percentage should be, whatever the hell it is. And we end up seeing more liquidity leave the network than was actually needed to leave to be, to maintain a safe and healthy state. Of the network itself, you overcorrect the problem, and now the Bitcoin pool and the ETH pool are like more shallow than they actually need to be, right? And it actually solves the wrong issue, right? And it kind of like kneecaps the the purpose or the benefit or the goal of savers itself. And when you start having less people be savers in a scenario where we don't want, we want people to be savers, we want people to add liquidity, we want people to be pools to be deeper, right? We just don't want to get to a point where it's since are greater than the quantity of LP in a sense. Like that's that's the problem. That's what we're trying to solve for. Not something else of creating a balance between X or Z. Like it, it just doesn't really quite create the correct balance. We're trying to go for it. It corrects it for a different balance that is not aligned to the, what's beneficial for the network itself. So like maybe I'm wrong about what I'm saying. And if I am, I, that'd be great. I would rather have I'd rather be wrong about this than be right about it. But if I if I'm um Right on what I'm what I'm thinking is that like this will prove to be you know negative for the protocol this kind of approach in which case I hope that the community sees that and adjusts and you know try something else that is more effective and achieve, achieves the goal that Sabres is trying to achieve. So one of the most the best outcomes would just be like more regular LP right so it's like would that be something to try to figure out how to incentivize like how do we just get more regular LP, which is kind of like the, the uh, shifting of rewards, I guess, plays out into that, right? Yeah, it does. In a sense, like more regular LPs come in um, because their, their yield is going to be, you know, higher and savers is going to be slightly lower. And so that is being shifted towards the LPs. And at a, and a, and a, on paper perspective, that kind of creates that incentive that you're talking about. Um, whether that is, that creates the correct balance we want, because to me, it's like, we don't want savers to be 25% and at dual LPs to be 75%. Like that's not optimal from my perspective, right? From my perspective, the optimal is 50% because that's when we have the pool is the most deep and we have the most liquidity and the cheapest fees and all these things. So like it's, it's just going to create a different balance from what my personal belief is the balance should be. Got it. Yeah, that's interesting. We'll see how that plays out. Yeah, we'll see how it plays out. We'll see what the community thinks about. It. I, th I think the likely the thing would be adopted. Most likely, I'm guessing, and we'll we'll see how it goes. Whether it undercorrects or overcorrects, we'll see which one happens. Yeah, I mean, either way, having a variable percentage of the LP fees going to 
savers. I mean, it makes sense no matter if, if you're trying to sell, like whether the goal of that is to solve this problem or not. I think it, it totally makes sense because as the city utilization increases, it does increase the leverage that's on LPs. So just by having some something that's dynamic and actually giving more towards LPs when they're more leveraged, uh, seem, it, it, it puts incentives in the right direction. Like, I mean, like totally what you said, where whether that, that magnitude is, is enough, but like it, it's definitely in the right the right direction of incentive alignment and putting things where they, where they should be when, when there's more leverage and they get more of the yield and the people who are taking less risk, you get, get less of that yield. Like that, that that's just, uh, it, that seems pretty basic. Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, yeah. Okay. It's a fair point. I mean, is there any other, so is there any other solutions that like, uh, but that, that come to mind for you, or is that is that just basically the the only thing like ne- like some kind of negative interest rate or, or low interest rate on on savers? No, I mean, it, I I had opened up a PR uh, for a, a different way of doing this, a similar thing, which was the interest rate for for savers is on a cliff rather than a slope, and so if the synth addition is below fifty percent, you get half half your yield, you get fifty percent of your yield. And if the synth utilization is above 50% uh, or, or equal to 50%, I suppose, or whatever the hell the net thing was, or above 50%, you'd get 0% interest. And so it's, instead of being like a gradual thing that starts at 50% and then, you know, twiddles down eventually to zero, it just like says, hey, once you get to this point, like we're just not going to have any interest. And so like it's gardeners for more liquidity to be added, 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 added until we get to a point where we don't want any more liquidity, Right. It's like the, we don't want – we want people to add more liquidity. Like it's, not like, it's not like we want less. <laughs> we want more, right? And so we don't want to take away the interest rates for those people to add liquidity when we want them to add liquidity, right? Like we want them to add more. So because the problem itself is a cliff in my mind, it's like once we have 50% utilization, like that's that's optimal point. And below it, we want more liquidity. And above it, we want less liquidity. Like because the problem itself, in my mind, is a cliff, the solution should also be a cliff, rather than being a sloping system, which is not relational to what is the, in the best interest of the protocol itself. I mean, just in terms of incentivizing liquidity, like, I, I mean, this is something that I haven't really thought of like a good solution to because it's it's a difficult problem because you need people that are that want exposure to ruin that want leverage exposure to ruin and. Uh, mm-hmm. And yeah, I mean, like people that that want to that you know obviously trust the protocol and go through like the the just just the technical complexity of like actually providing that liquidity. Um, like it, it's a difficult problem to solve because you need people who are aligned in all of all of those aspects. So I, I like I, yeah, I'm just like trying to think of other other ways to incentivize dual liquidity provision because it's it's not really something that like even a lot of like Thorchain interfaces offer, like it's really uh, like, I mean, obviously you can do it on like, you know, Thor wallet and, and Thor swap. Uh, that, that might actually be it, honestly, for the, uh, for, for like the, the major front ends that support uh, Thorchain. Right. 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 And even just reaching that larger audience of like, you know, who wants uh, like just, just, just reaching, just reaching them and saying like, "Hey, who wants to provide liquidity?" Like that, that's it's a difficult problem to actually uh, be able to to solve. So I, yeah, I'm just just kind of ripping on just like, wait, like how how do you actually solve that problem of incentivizing dual liquidity? I'm wondering, I'm wondering if there's just other mechanisms that I don't know if, if you thought of or just like anything else to just make a dual LP just a more a- attractive product. Yeah, I mean, I think we've I think we've tapped as much as we can reasonably do with it. Um, even like ILP was a thing for a while, and um, that was like another thing we did. It, and and people are against ILP. Like some people are for it, some people are against it. And I, and there's valuable arguments from both directions, uh, valid arguments in both directions. But uh, I don't think there's much more we can do, as from my perspective, to incentivize LPs more, other than like increasing the block reward or something, something like this. Um, I think like what I had learned through the process of building this protocol and launching it and seeing how it kind of fares in, in the real market conditions 
is that like trying to get people to, you know, buy Rune and hold it and sell half of their Bitcoin to Rune and, and do it. So it's actually like kind of a difficult thing to do. It's actually more difficult than I would have expected it to be, to be honest. Yeah, hundred percent. And so, and so like, once we thought about the idea like, well, we need the pools to be deeper and we're, we're trying to sell people on, you know, buying Rune basically and, and, and being an LP and these kind of things. And, and we can do that. We've been doing it and it's, you know, for the most part, it's been, you know, you can't argue it's, it's been pretty good, but like, once we realized that there was a way to do this on, on a single sided perspective with like just BBC or just ETH or just Adam or whatever, like that became like an immediate thing of like, well, now it's growing the TVL becomes, you know, quite easy at that point. And, and, and to be fair, like Sabres has kind of proven that already. Like it's only been a few months and it's like already shown that it's a very well, you know, uh, uh, adopted uh, feature. Right. And people are actually using it and all this kind of stuff. So like, to me, it's like in the end, the, what we want from the protocols perspective is just like we want deep pools. We don't really care if it's do LPs or, or savers. We just want deep pools. We want that deep pools be managed in a way that is like healthy, right, and, and safe. And so like that's where like that kind of comes in. And and I think the POL itself is like is like kind of helping to, to scale the, the dual sides um, as needed, right, to help it, you know provide liquidity on the on, on the rune side because the protocol itself is you know is like the most diamond hand holder of rune that you could possibly have it's only operating in the best interest of the protocol and not the best interest of it's like want to buy a lambo or or something like this like its only interest is to, is to provide for the protocol and do with the best interest of the protocol itself and so like it's now kind of stepping in and it's deployed almost five million rune into um the bitcoin pool to help you know grow the liquidity, but also help support the LPs and also help the fees be lower, the swap fees be lower for for traders and this kind of stuff. Like it's doing a really good job in doing what it does, uh, and so like I think that's also helping on the dual side. It's just the the POL. Yeah, I've been noticing that tick up nice and steadily and kind of level off over the past like week or so. Uh, yeah, eleven and a half percent of the pool right now with like a. I mean, it's four four million rune deployed, but I mean, it, it definitely has increased the the total depth of the pool and just how much asset is actually in the pool. Like, if you look at, uh, like, I, I've been like, not checking it like super closely, but you know, just checking like the, the the pool depth and like how much Bitcoin is actually in the pools, and it, it actually does, does seem to uh, like work as intended, sucking in. Bitcoin into the pool and just making it deeper, which is obviously the intended thing. But the the issue is the uh, is the hard security cap at this point. And is that just because? So are we just close to the security cap because of the the total effective bond and it being measured against the, the total effective bond rather than the, the the total bond? Do you know how much room is actually left in uh like in the pools itself to to be added? Uh, last I checked, it was about. 3.3 million rune is like yeah so it's the effective bond and so people who don't know the effective bond like the total bond the total number of rune and the and the bonded notes which is like i think like 80 million or something like this the effective bond is basically the amount of rune that the bottom two-thirds like the lowest two-thirds bonders which is effectively about 50 million rune right, right around that area and so, like, right now, we're, we're at, like, 47 million room total in the pools. The effective bond is approximately 50 million. And so that's where the hard cap is because if you can, if you can acquire two-thirds of the lowest bonders, like that's the amount of security we have. Because that's, that's the number of room that's required to Sybil attack the network and steal all the fees, steal all the, uh, the assets. And so, like, that's just kind of the, what we call the effective bond, effective security. Uh, so we're about 3 million away from it right now. That's probably going to drop in the next like day or two, just because we're going to do a churn. Uh, last time I looked, there was only one validator waiting to be churned in, which means it's probably going to be like one in and like two, maybe three out. And so the total number of validators will drop like by one or two, and then three days later, like it'll go back up to you know eighty nine or something like this, like a slightly higher number. So it will probably drop in the next like few days, to be honest with you. Um, and with, with Binance Smart Chain launching, if that does happen, uh, obviously that's going to you know create some liquidity in the network and 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 bring out more of that three million buffer, that three million kind of like space we have now. And so like once we get to the actual cap, which maybe Binance Smart Chain does that, and it's only a six million, that's about six million depth of a pool, both for asset and room. 
Um, that, that could happen maybe with, with Binance Smart Chain in the first like few weeks or maybe first month or something like this. And if that's the case, then we have the max TVL, which means nobody can have liquidity. Uh, you can't mint more since, um, you know, like it, it, uh, functionality effectively is unavailable. Uh, from for for the community at that point, which is a good problem to have, it's like a champagne problem in a manner of speaking. Like we're we're doing so well that we've hit our cap. So then it becomes like, well, how do we get how do we solve this problem? Like how do we actually you know get away from the the, the max TVL and actually get the max TVL to be a higher number? Well, that's where lending comes in, right? There's another one of the talks we're we're, we're talking about in the community this week. It's like once lending is launched, um, well, maybe not the soft launch because there'll be like not a lot of loans going out because it's uh, on purpose, but like. But like once lending is like fully swinging, right, and you're, and you're having people opening loans, buying up room, which causes liquidity to be pulled up the Binance and back into the pools, which causes the order books to become, you know, thinner in a matter of speaking and, and higher up in terms of price. And then you're burning all that room. Like that's going to create room's value to go up, which means the TVL like will also increase and the bond will also increase. And like that will, you know, and cent utilization decreases in that scenario, right? So like it, it, that's like the next step to help scale this network even beyond where we are now is hopefully lending is going to play, play a major role in that. So, okay, one thing about this. Um, okay, so if we're so close to the, if, like the hard security cap, why is the, like the share factor between, you know, what goes to LPs and what goes to nodes only like 40%? Shouldn't it be like pretty lopsided if we're only... 3 million rune or, or less away. Right. So the reason why that is, is because we made a code change. Um, I want to say a year and a half ago, I'm not really sure of the exact number, but like that we um, changed the max TBL to be relational to the effective security rather than total security, right? The 80 million versus the 50 million, the 50 million versus 80 million, whatever it is. And so like the pendulum is swinging off of the total security off of the 80 million number. And the max TVL is operating off of the effective security, which is the 50 million number. Do you see what I mean? And so like the pendulum can only swing so far in this scenario because one, the pendulum is using a different metric than the hard cap. Right. Is but, but why would they be using, using a, a different metric? Why would they be using a different metric? Yeah. So when effective security was first implemented a while back, this is something that I was advocating for that, that the pendulum should swing with it. But uh, Lena and amongst other individuals were just like, you know, I'll just keep it the way it is and, you know, and just keep it that way. And I, I, there was a little bit of a, of, a, of a battle about it and a disagreement about it. And in the end, I kind of like buckled on it just because I thought to myself like, well, you know, it's not that big of a deal right now. And if it comes a problem later, we can always just like, you know, make a three line change to fix it. Like it's not like a big deal or anything. So it's not really worth getting into a, you know, forever argument about a problem that may not be an issue at all. So it's like, let's just wait for it to be an issue. And then if it is an issue, like let's rehash the conversation and deal with it as we want to. So that might be a, a, a change that might make that may happen into the future. But then again, like if the savers change that is being, you know, proposed in one, 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 one version, one, 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 if that is an overcorrection, as I suspect it possibly could be, then the whole max TVL problem kind of goes away because we, we start losing a lot of liquidity in the pools. And instead of having a 3 million gap between us and the max TVL, we have a 4 million or 5 million or whatever the hell happens from that thing. So it's like, we may not even have that issue if we launch this like savers change, right? Yeah, I mean, I'm really not quite understanding why, why they'd advocate for... Uh, for it to be the effective, for it to be the total bond on the the incentive pendulum, because that is that's essentially uh, like like that that's what's supposed to balance the, the total amount of security yeah. and and liquidity on the network. And if it's not like properly, just it, like if all right, if we're maxed out and and uh, like the whole point is to basically you know drive LP yields lower, so that way uh, you know LPs can choose to can choose to leave or is that is that the decision that that's basically made where it's like well we don't really want lps to leave so we, we don't really want to drive yields lower to, for lps yeah to be honest i i don't quite remember the specifics of the argument I, 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 uh, for the idea of having operating off of two different metrics 
I can't remember. It's, it's been a long time, and, and I don't want to like misspeak or mislab or mis kind of argue the other side. Yeah, fair I agree with you personally. Like I I I think that the pendulum and the max TVL should be operating off of the same metric, whatever the metric that is. It should be the same, and that's what I was arguing for back in the day. But then it just yeah. was d- debated against, and I just it didn't seem like an important enough issue at that time to like really kind of stick my feet in them in the mud about it and just kind of like, you know what, we'll just go through what it is. And if it's a problem, we'll fix it. It's not a big deal. Right. Yeah. This way it kind of seems like it's capped on one side, but not on the other. So it's like, if it, if you can't pass the effective cap by adding liquidity, the only way you can is by rune dropping. So then that would be the only thing that would cause it to go past the effective security, which is then when the incentive pendulum would kick in. Right. So like, it's kind of like the safeguard that only kicks in in a very specific scenario with the way it is right now, I guess. Yeah. I mean, hypothetically, if, if we had like a magic wand, we just, we just changed it right now. Right. Just like, uh, with some sort of magical, uh, spell of some kind. Um, the result hypothetically would be that the nodes would earn, start earning a lot more money and the, uh, the LPs and the savers would be earning less money and that would cause, you know, them to leave. I mean, it caused hopefully more nodes to come, which may or may not be true. I mean, they're already earning like, what is it like twenty percent APY, which is pretty, you know, pretty sexy uh, API wise. A- API wise with very little downside or risk. Um, so it's already pretty, you know, great on their side already. And like, there's the argument about like, well, if we increase it from twenty percent to twenty five or thirty, like, are we going to get more bonders? Maybe not. I mean, it won't be that effective in terms of attracting more liquidity. If twenty doesn't do it, then is thirty really going to do it? And if we start killing the you know the yield for LPs and savers, we're reducing it now. When you know you know Bitcoin yield is relatively low uh, these days, uh, IL IL is relatively high because um, you know Bitcoin saw three x downward from the bull market to the bear, and ruined so like a twenty x downward. So that creates a, you know good amount of IL, uh, and so that becomes like you know a problem of like, well, do we want LPs to leave now, or do we not? And to me, it's just like I don't. I don't actually don't really want LPs to leave right now. I think. No, I, I totally agree are. with you. We, d- we definitely don't want LPs to leave. But yeah, like it, it, especially, but it, it seems strange. It, maybe maybe this, the stranger change is more just capping it on, capping the amount on the hard secure on the. Uh, uh, I, I forget the whatever term we're using, but the oh, sorry, the effective security cap because uh, like isn't that effect- I mean, that's effectively limiting how much like dual LPs we can actually support uh, on the network. Like, like that, that, that part is Correct. actually limiting the amount of liquidity that we could, that we could support. And right. It, it, well, like, I mean, it, yeah. Yeah. And no, that's, that's right. Um, I think that was just like the change of like the realization that like, well, technically we can't do like a two to one ratio between savers and uh, bond. Uh, sorry. Say uh, bond and, uh, and, and, and the pool itself. Um, because of the effective security idea of like, well, you only need the bottom two thirds to be able to attack the network. And therefore it would be profitable if it was hundred percent full at the total, at the total security, so the effective security. And so like that change was made, but um, yeah, I mean, it, this is another discussion where we can, we'll probably have a PR that's open. Maybe we won't, I don't know people can talk about it, but like, well, you might have a, a change or a, a vote going out to the community of changing the, you know, how the pendulum swings on the total security versus the effective security. I mean, this particular case, like for nodes, like they're they're gonna like it because they're they make more money. <laughs> so, from from a nodes perspective, like they're you know they probably vote yes on this because it means higher income for them. So I don't I don't, don't know why they would vote against it unless they feel like the last of, the lack of LPs or the leaving of LPs would be significant enough to cause a problem. Which I don't know. Well, it seems like the smarter way would be to do it the other way around, where you stop the. Uh where you stop it from being calculated off of the, the total effective security. So then that, that actually allows more dual LPs to enter the network, which is like, I mean, obviously from the node perspective, yeah, they, they want to earn more money, but like for network health, like we, we do need more dual LPs and capping that for like this scenario where someone gets a, you know, someone, someone bonds in 66 nodes right now doesn't seem like the most likely scenario to be happening at the moment. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, there's also like the the pendulum itself is actually also has like settings in terms of like the the curve of that pendulum, for lack of a better term. Like, 
it's, it's I don't think it's actually, it, it can be programmed in a way that it's linear. The relationship between LPs and, and nodes are, are linear in terms of the income. And it can be coded in a way or configured in a way that where it's like nonlinear, where it like swings more harshly in some scenarios and less, less harshly in other scenarios. So like that's the other kind of way of thinking about it or another uh, approach to the issue, right? Yeah, probably good to have a to revisit that conversation. I mean, especially since we're like if we're approaching the hard security cap, then it's like a discussion we're definitely going to need to have at some point. Yeah, yeah, but then again, like if if, if the savers idea passes, then this this conversation about the pendulum may not be, you know, uh, needed to be had up anymore because we're no no longer close to the TV, the TBL. Right. So, uh, like in the scenario that we do hit it, uh, like what, like what actually happens on the network? Can people still make swaps if we're at the hard security cap? Yeah, you can still swap. Swapping will still be fine. Um, you can still withdraw liquidity. That'll be fine. Uh, you won't be able to add liquidity, and you won't be able to mint since, but you'll be able to burn since, um, like that kind of stuff. Basically, arbitrage bots would be less effective because they would be. Arbing via layer one, um, which is takes, which is more expensive and takes more time. It's not as eff effective or as efficient as using um, synthetics to arbitrage pools. And so, like the, the effectiveness of arbs would, would be reduced to pre-synthetic points. Like single chain chaos net never had synthetics, and we took us about a year to launch synthetics on multi-chain chaos. If we go back to that scenario, we don't have sense anymore being used for that purpose. Um, that kind of stuff. But like, it's not like. It, if that happens, like I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be panicking or anything like that. It's not it's something to be all that concerned about. It's just like, well, we've basically hit the cap that we can scale to, and this is the maximum the network can actually scale into the TVL. So, you know, now we have a problem of how do we scale beyond this point? Like that, that that's more of the concern than than like the network is going to collapse or fall or something like this. Or that, I'm not concerned about that. Cool, cool, cool. Um... Yeah, other things talk like do you, do you want to? Is there like uh, any interesting uh, lending stuff you want to talk about? BSC. I know you had some some takes on on Binance Smart Chain as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, it's not it's not a popular take, seemingly. Uh, it's kind of the unpopular position, but um, you know, we we voted on Binance Smart Chain like you know ten months ago, whatever the hell the number was to add it and. The conditions of the, the the conditions of the network were different than it is today, right? And I think because of that, it warrants you know another look at it, an honest look. And back then, we weren't worried about hitting a max TBL, right? And when we were adding new chains, like we had plenty of space to add new chains. And so, whereas right now we only got like three point three million, or whatever the number is, I haven't looked in a, in a day or two, but like like we you know we don't have that much space, so the pool can only get so deep. And if the pool can only get so deep, you can only generate so much income. If they generate so much, only so much income, you know, and the and the operators have to spend only you know, approximately a thousand dollars a month per operator. So that's you know approximately not ninety thousand dollars per month for the for the operators as a whole. Well, is it going to generate enough income to to offset the cost of running the chain? And to be honest, that seems extremely unlikely to me, considering things like you would have to become like one of the biggest pools in in in, in like in the, in the network, like about the same trade volume as like Bitcoin or something like this. And it's going to be like, like six times shallower than the Bitcoin pool can, it, it literally cannot get, you know, <laughs> that big relative to Bitcoin. So it's just like the odds of it accomplishing that task right now is very unlikely to me. I, I think objectively so that's like, it's, it, 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 I don't care how much trust wallet passes through that thing. It's just not going to do it. Um, especially when there's like other bridges they can use. They don't have to use, you know, ThorChain. They can use other bridges that exist. Like we're not the only providers. So they're just going to go somewhere else because the fees can be too high. So like, I, this doesn't seem like it's going to happen. And plus I, I don't want to get to a position where we're like, you know, adding new chains, like right before we hit the cap, the max TVL cap. That just doesn't seem like, like doesn't make any sense to do so. It's just, it's just completely illogical if you ask me, you know? Um, not, not to mention that, like, by doing so, we're actually taking away from the POL's uh, ability to enter more position, right? And to support the synths and support the Bitcoin LPs. Like, it's not only it can't do it anymore because we just launched a Binance Smart Chain, which is 
obviously not going to add that much value or liquidity to the network considering that the pool won't get deep enough to allow it to do so. So it doesn't make sense to me to add Binance Smart Chain right now. In the future, that could certainly change. I'm not against Binance Smart Chain. I have no hate over here. It's just like, let's look at the network objectively. It doesn't make sense. And to me, it doesn't. But does it cost the network or it costs the node operators? I mean, I guess there's some block rewards going to that pool, right? But like if the node operators are willing to eat that expense and just like have Thorchain be more effective and be like a better product, just like ramping up for, you know, when volumes come back and stuff, then like, then, then why not if, if, if they're willing to like foot the bill for that? Well, n- nodes get block rewards no matter what, right? So they're not going to get more block rewards just because Binance was added tomorrow. So the block rewards are un- unchanged or have to ship it. The question is, did they get income from the, from the swaps? Enough income to warrant the cost. Now, if you want to make the argument that node operators are like, you know what, I'll burn $12,000 a year of my own money just so that we have Binance Smart Chain on, on, the, on the docket, then they can make that choice. It, just, it makes little economic sense to me right, right now, to be honest with you, but they can make that choice and maybe that's the choice they're going to make. Right, that's they can, and they can do that. They, they, they know they can make whatever choices they want, right? But why not just like add buy and smart chain when it makes more sense to, rather than when it doesn't make sense to? Like we're at the bottom of the bear. Adding buy and smart chain right now is not going to like. The only thing is really gonna, like it's not going to move the needle of Thorchain success, right? We want Thorchain to be successful and achieve the goal of the number one cryptocurrency exchange in the world, bar none, including centralized exchanges, like. Adding Binance Smart Chain is not going to accomplish that right now. It's, it's just not going to move the needle very much. What is going to move the needle is lending, streaming swaps, like these kind of things. Those things will certainly move the needle. In my opinion, that's true. But like Binance Smart Chain will not move that needle now. It might do it in six months or a year or something like this in the future. Sure. Awesome. Let's do it then. But right now, it I, don't, yeah. I just don't see how it makes sense. I mean, do, do, do you I think that ADAX from. or it's... Adam move the needle at all? No, I don't. Yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm agreeing with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like we've, we have never added a chain with the exception of Terra. We've never added a chain to the network that has actually moved the needle. Like it's been, we, we add some new chain like AVAX, whatever. There's a few tweets about it. People kind of like clap on Twitter for all the five minutes. Then like, that's it. Like, cause none of those chains actually had buy-in from those communities, right? Like, you know, like the people behind AVAX, the marketing teams, all this stuff, like they're just, they don't care. Like the same thing with Doge, like all these guys, they don't give a shit, which why I don't understand. We can get that a bit different topic and different conversation. But like the only chain we've added that actually like had a lot of value was Terra. And unfortunately Terra collapsed. And so we don't have that value today, but like we had huge income coming from Terra. And we had huge liquidity being added to the network. We had like tons of swaps happening because the Terra community is behind it. Like Doe was about it, was all about it. They were tweeting about it. They were going to integrate with every wallet within the Terra ecosystem. Like they were like totally 100% on board. And they were like fans, right, of, of, of Thorchain. And it made sense in that scenario. So like, I think we like, even though a chain like Dash, for example, like I'm not personally a big Dash fan. Right. And I'm, I don't really care about Dash or Binance Smart Chain or any of these chains. Like, my personal opinion of whether I buy all those assets has nothing to do with this competition whatsoever. Like, but the Dash community is like behind the idea of being, of being added and they're like all in it. And even though the liquidity of Dash is far less than Binance Smart Chain and the trade volume is far less, like we would capture a higher percentage of that trade volume from that community. If we launch Binance Smart Chain tomorrow, like the most total number of trades and swaps we're going to get from that is probably not going to be that much, to be honest with you. Same thing as AVAX and same thing as Gaia and same thing as like all these other Doge and all these other things we added since we launched Monthly Chain Chaos now. It just doesn't seem like it's like we can't just – adding chains does not just like cause more liquidity to come. It's just like obviously we've seen this happen time and time again and we just like needing to be reproven the same issue over and over again, which is just like we're in an infinite fucking loop now, which is just like so frustrating. It's like stop adding random fucking chains. I know people like high market caps, which is – Something that I personally believed in also at the beginning of like the launching of the chain case and like we're going to add the high, highest market cap assets. Like I fell into that assumption incorrectly myself, but then I was like proven wrong by adding a bunch of chains like Doge and AVAX and whatever else. And it doesn't, just, it doesn't add liquidity. It doesn't add trade volume. It doesn't work that way. You just, what, what does work is just getting the other community to be like, yeah, let's fucking do it. Let's party. Right. That's what works. So like, I'm all for adding Terra because they were all for it, right? I'm all for adding Dash because they're all for it. Radix is another 
chain, slow market, a low market cap, but like that entire community would become like diehard Rune fans, become Thor Chats themselves, and create more value into the into the product than Binance Smart Chain will. Yeah, I see where you're coming from. Um, I mean, yeah, I also agree. Like, yeah, it might be six months, twelve months, maybe never. Who knows? Until like an integration like that is actually valuable, but it does seem like the nodes are in favor of it. At least, I mean, the vote's not over, but uh, it, I'd be, I mean, I know the nodes are anonymous for the most part, but like, I don't know if anyone sent any messages in, but it seems like they want it. So they're signaling that. Yeah. Um, but I, I just feel like the arguments that people make for it from what I've seen is like, it's just based upon this belief that, Hey, look at Binance smart chain. It has total, like the TVL in that, in that chain and the liquidity and the trade volume is like, Great, let's capture it. But like, we keep on seeing this. This that this doesn't work that way. You just can't. Yeah, I still. I mean, I just like in my mind, I see Thorchain as getting like it. It becomes it. It's like it becomes exponentially more valuable with every other chain that's in it, right? Because then you can go from everything else that's already integrated to everything that that new chain brings in, and like over time, it feels like that is really like the huge value prop of Thorchain is like. Yeah you can go from anything to anything and not just like, Oh, well you can go between these five chains because these are the ones that make economic sense. It's like, rather if, if you can just be the everything decks, then it's like, it, you just, you just become like the, the, the leader in that sense. But yeah, I don't know. I see both I, sides. I, I, but. I agree with what you're saying. Like I would love to be the anything decks as you put it, like, and have Binance smart chain and, and various other chains. And as it, like, I've been more bullish to be honest with you with like a higher quantity of chains and Thor chain than like, probably anybody else within the within our within the devs like like i'm actually for like having you know 30 chains or something like this like something like most devs are just like they just want very few and like for me i'm like i'm all for adding more but the 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 caveat is that we need them to be into it so like let's imagine a hypothetical scenario where lending is is, you know doing well and rune pops off and the price creates like you know eyes on the asset and eyes on the project which is natural natural to occur when your price is pumping and like maybe from that like people start being more aware of us and be more interested in the project and more see us as more like innovators or whatever maybe the people behind binance smart chain the binance people themselves start to see that value blah blah, blah and and integrate or or, or whatever or like get behind it but like I, I even in our, in our like, we know binance like our team like we have a, we have a communications with that team as you know we first listed our token, you know, years ago, and and like in the conversation we've had so far with them, like and like there hasn't been, you know, uh, you know, thus far we we've asked that they be interested in like you know co-marketing or whatever. And like this is like it's just like you know dust. It's like it's like the silence from from them, right? Like meanwhile they support like you know any swap, multi chains like any swap on their on their UI. So it's just like which has already been like rugged and you know all the money's gone like it's just like so frustrating in a sense you know no i understand where you're coming from i mean i i like i'm in i'm personally in, in touch with some of the binance uh like the bnb chain people and like they, they're everyone that i've talked to in the binance ecosystem whether it's the trust wallet people or like the bnb chain people they, they're all super supportive of seeing bsc on on thor chain like obviously we're like they consider us like partly part of the ecosystem already because we have we have beacon chain which is very successful on on thor chain but um, it, it's, it, I definitely wouldn't say that there's that there's no support. Um, it, it's something that I'm like I'm definitely working on is just like just well, seeing that we get is, that support there, from Binance. Yeah. Is there is there any public support? Like, will they provide uh, capital to the pools? Will they tweet about it? Will they do spaces? Will they? Like, is there any kind of public support rather than just like a pat in the back via an email? Yeah, I mean that kind of thing. We're, I mean that's that's yet to be seen. Like obviously, like we, we don't know what's what's really going to happen at, at the end of the day. But it's not anything that can't be undone either. It's like if if Binance Smart Chain turns out to be a huge mistake, then we get rid of it. And same as Avax or or Atom or really anything else. So I mean, I, like obviously, like we we do we like as like a as like a group of people are up for like experimenting with things and you know like it even you know rolling back things that don't make sense and just just adapting to whatever circumstances come our way so like uh 
So, I mean, it, it's not like anything that's 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 done. Either. Like we get Binance Smart Chain, it's and it, it fails. It's like, oh my god, we just ruined everything. It's just like, all right, well, you know, if it's if if it sucks, then 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 it's out. You know, it doesn't doesn't need to stay uh, forever if it's a if it's a forever a bad decision. Uh, that's true, but like it's always harder to remove things than to add them, right? Like yeah. even in like just traditional politics, if you you know add a new uh, you know healthcare something whatever, that's really great. You know, and then people start using it, and then like, you know, a year later, you're like, well, we're going to remove this thing now. It becomes, you know, more toxicity and more arguments, and like, it's, it's like it's more difficult, you know, from a consensus perspective to like or a governance perspective. Well, to, well, you're right, but as a, like a failure would be that nodes are losing a bunch of money per month and not getting anything in in, in return, which I think it, it's not like if if things are going south. In terms of like, hey, this is like cost way too much, and there's there, uh, there's no support, and Trust Wall didn't do any volume. Then it's like th- there would be no reason. Like it's all just economic incentive. If if there is, right. the, it, like if there is uh, like enough actually going through that pool to incentivize the nodes to keep running it, then they'll keep running it. And if if it's murky, then then it's murky, and maybe it doesn't get re- resolved. And then if it's if it's straight up bad, then it gets booted out which yeah. i mean it, that could happen to any chain that's like currently on it today it could happen to, to to beacon chain which is like you know far and away one of the most successful on thor chain obviously it's been there since the beginning and you know thor chain was a, yep. a bep2 dex beforehand but uh you know beacon chain might not be around forever like it, <laughs> it, it it's probably gonna go away at, at some point right in favor yep. of BSA. that's true yeah, absolutely. That's definitely true. And we can we can do the experiment. We can try it. We can add Binance Smart Chain and, you know, come back in a month and, like, say, like, what's it been? What's the liquidity at? What's the trade volume at? How much nodes are, are making? Right? All that stuff. And we can... Now- I think we got to... I think we got to come back in, like, six months, 12 months, 18 months. Because to me, it feels like what the nodes are signaling is essentially... I think the nodes understand your argument. And I think they're basically signaling, yes, we're going to lose money for now. But let's do this to lay the groundwork, see how it goes. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, a lot of the things that Cow just said, and yeah, maybe there, maybe I'm spending eight hundred bucks a month and making two hundred bucks a month right now. But maybe in twelve months, I'm spending eight hundred bucks and making five thousand a month, right? So, yep. also yeah, like yeah. Yeah, we, we've said this before in the past, but we didn't explicitly say it today. But uh, just increase in, incre- in increasing the total decentralization of the network, as in like how many bare metal nodes there are, which is one of the metrics that like we for sure need to increase. Uh, and like something, it's something that's a very difficult problem to solve. But like adding new chains that are like you know quote unquote expensive, it, like w- what do you think about about that? Like um, we we had Binance Smart Chain uh, and you know cloud p- cloud providers are like. Cloud node operators are hurt financially because they need to run more. Uh, they need to run a, a you know a BSC daemon. But if they're already on bare metal and they're just like, all right, well, all right, sounds good. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll see you next week. And, right. uh, and they, they're unaffected, and it just increases the push towards bare metal. Yeah, that's true. Like a valid point. Like if if you are running a bare metal node now, uh, most likely. I don't know the specifics of that person's hardware, of course, but most likely they can just run this on top and it doesn't actually add any additional cost from their perspective, from a bare metals perspective. Um, but if you're running, you know, AWS, whatever, it's going to cost you extra thousands. So that creates more pressure to get rid of the AWS node and spin up a, you know, bare metal node. So maybe that'll be a, the result of Binance Smart Chain is to get, in, increase the quantity of bare metal nodes, you know, which would be great. Right? That'd be awesome. You know, but like not everybody who has a node operator has the technical expertise to run bare metal. Bare metal is a lot more difficult uh, to run than something in the cloud provider. Right. But I, I mean, I mean, that's another question too. Like, should, do, do, do we care about how technical they are? Do, like the, the end goal is to, you know, be like, the, the increase the total decentralization of the network. If that if that's the, the end goal, then, you know, it shouldn't matter if like, all right, if this guy, can't cut it then like then what's he gonna do we're just gonna keep running on uh cloud services forever i don't know in that particular case maybe but like I, we only like theoretically the the the, the best case scenario is like we would get like 67 percent of the nodes would be running on bare metal i don't know how much of them on now like i thought it was like 10 percent, but maybe it's closer to 15 or something like this today um and so like getting a number up to 67 percent would be hard because it's asking a lot of people to do very diff- a lot of people to do very difficult things, 
but it'd be great if we can get there. And what's better than financial <laughs> financial incentives to get there, I guess. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly what I'm saying. Yeah, exactly. I know I agree with you. I agree with you. I don't know. I'm excited for, for BSC. Uh, the, the, the B&B. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be fun, man. Come on. It'll, it'll be fun. It'll definitely be an interesting case, to, like a, an interesting case study, right? To see how it actually fares and how it actually performs. And, you know, being at such a large deck with large, large liquidity, um, a large, you know, ecosystem. Let's, we'll, we'll watch it yeah. closely and see what happens. No, no, I, no, I totally understand the whole Terra point. And uh, also, I, I feel like what Terra proves is that, like, we can launch new chains on ThorChain and have it be successful. Like, they, and whether they need to be, like, frenzying to, to LP. Like, obviously, that's a huge, like, positive driver towards the success of it. But it, it does prove that we can launch a new chain on ThorChain, and we can see success come out of it. That doesn't have to end in right. a Terra scenario. But yeah, it, it doesn't mean that yeah, every that's... chain that we launch and has failed. Binance already holds Rune, right? So, like... Wouldn't it? I mean, it would make sense for them to LP, like even more than it made sense for like Terra or Avax or something else, right? I mean, they they literally would just pair their Rune and pair their their yeah. BNB. Well, it's also customer. Yeah, I don't, I don't know how much. <laughs> so, yeah. You, you, well, yeah, but I I, I thought like I'm don't, sure they do. I mean, don't so, they just yeah. have um, from like their some... early investment? Not not yeah, the customer they, deposits. They, <laughs> they have some room, but they they have to keep because it's a traded asset right on their exchange they have to keep some of it you know in their cold storage you know so that they can pull from it if they need to they can't just put it, like all like on a remote uh put it on the on door chain or whatever like you have to keep some of it kind of on hand yeah but it's interesting because it's so many different entities that are like in i'm um, part of like one umbrella like you know they're like the, the trust wallet people are their their own group then there's the bnb chain people which are separate from like the like the the Binance people, uh, it, it's all just different groups, and they're all, you know, it, there's a, a lot of a lot a lot of people that actually, you know, work for the whole Binance umbrella, and then like smaller groups that work in those smaller groups. Uh, it's definitely interesting to like yep. kind of see how like I, like honestly, I don't even know who 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 uh, you know to, to ask about like LPing or things like that, but like uh, you know the the, the, the actual like I mean, developer been... people are very excited about BSC on Thorchain. Um, we've been talking to them for a long time about like getting them to, to run nodes and that kind of stuff. And it's, it's kind of difficult to get them to do it, you know? And that's like, I mean, they've even made complaints in the past about um, how we update the network too frequently. <laughs> like we, we make too many changes or innovations too fast and, and, and they have a hard time keeping up with all the changes and having the time that they want to evaluate changes and all these kind of things and like to me it's just like we're moving fast we're shipping like we're not, i don't i'm not slowing down <laughs> how about we how about we talk about what you are excited about which is lending <laughs> <laughs> yeah I'm what's excited. A, I'm, I'm, yeah i'm excited obviously i've been excited for a long time on lending i'd be really interested to see how it kind of how it fares once it hits the hits, hits a real market and market response to the concept. Um, we just did a uh, spaces or, or, or a, um, stage, I should stages, space stage, whatever it is, discord stages, whatever it's called um, last week where we kind of did some, some technical like deep dives and that kind of stuff and Q and A and that kind of stuff. It was actually really good. It's, it's on um, the, I think, uh, Tor, uh, Kyle. I, I just pinned it to the top. It's, it's uh, yeah, it's on nine realms is YouTube. So, and uh, posted in Dev Discord. I just tweeted it out uh, a little bit ago. So the, the whole recording is up. It's, yeah. it's basically just the entire like soft launch process, which is which is going to be the, uh, the the scaling period where like you know initially like not not so usable and minimal front end support, and then uh, you know a- after just validating some of the concepts and actually testing it like in the wild with with uh, on actual mainnet, then eventually we scale up and you know basically you know, raise the cap so to speak and yeah then then we're like game we, we launch all the front ends and then that's when we actually make all the uh all the pushes that we that we want to make 
Yeah, one of the interesting conversations we had in that in that chat was about um, a team called Block Science. Uh, I don't know, Torchad. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, familiar Kyle. Do you want to kind of talk about that real quick, or do you want me to do it? Yeah, I mean, I know a little bit about Block Science. Uh, they, they so they have a program called CAD CAD, which is a uh, it, it basically does like token economic simulations. So they're going to be running a bunch of of simulations on uh, on just the whole entire lending program. Now I don't know like too many specifics about it, but uh, they're basically going to be recommending the, uh, the, the starting parameters for, uh, for lending some of the success criteria and just kind of be there as a, as a partner and someone that, that is, uh, you know, experienced in the whole like economic design area in, uh, you know, just being there to also help keep an eye on the lending protocol with, uh, with nine realms and the core devs. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to have uh, them as a partner to kind of help have a third party, an unbiased third party to, you know, like to analyze the, the economics and the design and, and, and model it out and, and kind of give some ideas or feedback or, or on concepts and ideas and even make suggestions about, you know, what should be the launch parameters for the future? Like, you know, what should be the max um, causation ratio? What should be the min causation ratio? That, that kind of stuff. Um, and make recommendations based upon their their modeling and that kind of stuff. And it'd be great just to have another um, experienced economic team to to take a look at and and give us their own honest feedback. Like we obviously aren't uh, uh, paying them to scratch our back in a matter of speaking. We're we're paying them to to, to do a, a deep deep analysis and give us a, a you know a legit and authentic response, right? Um, and so I'd be very interested to see their their reaction, their thoughts. So is the idea to have it, and I haven't listened to the, that stage yet, so I, I might be a little behind, but is the idea to have it go live on mainnet kind of quietly, like before front ends, while there's, before front ends go up? So like, while there's those caps in place, kind of get it like tested in the wild, but not like fully push it? Is, is that kind of like the, the expected rollout? Yeah, I think so. Publicly, like... Um... Nine Realms has been talking about like a soft launch and a hard launch, and the reasoning behind it, uh, if I understand Pluto's like messages, uh, is that the soft launch will be will be quite small and tight, and you know the product itself wouldn't be very usable on any, any kind of like larger scale, just because we have very tight parameters around it, just to keep it small and and, and you know the risk very low in the earlier days. And we'll, we'll spend some time just like analyzing the performance of it and making sure that the behavior is correct. There's no, you know, bugs or conditions that are causing, you know, unfavorable scenarios, whatever. And, you know, be monitoring that closely. And then if we find any problems or issues, obviously just make a patch and, and carry on. Um, and so that once we feel that like we've tested it, you know, in the live, you know, with real people opening loans and closing loans and whatever else, and we feel that it's like it's performing quite well, you know, we can probably move it from soft to a hard, you know, launch soon after. Uh, how long that is, I don't really know. Like, you know, the the community will really tell us how long it's going to be more than anything else, right? In my mind, like, I'm, I'm more inclined to be to keeping that on a, on a shorter range, like, in my, just my, my own two cents. You know, maybe you launch it for, like, two weeks or maybe a month at most, and then, then, then just go ahead and let it fly. Not let it fly as in, like, no caps or anything like this, but, like, just let it fly as in, like, you know, scale up the, scale up the caps. And just to expand on that a, a little bit, it, it's not even just for like, you know, testing everything and making sure everything is live. It's so it's also so we can coordinate uh, just like like a general push out there, because like w once lending is live, there's going to be like a, everyone's going to want to say like, hey, lending is live. Tell everyone, you know, but if we launch lending in like this capped state, it's not going to be like on, on day one, it's not going to be in the usable state where we can say like, all right, like everybody tell everyone, you know, if, if everyone does that, they're going to see, you know, uh, really bad CRs. Like it's, it's not going to be in, in the state where it's ready to be presented to a larger audience. So part of the reason for this like soft launch, hard launch phase is also to make sure that, uh, that interfaces are like ready to go and, and not just ready to go, but like actually polished and, you know, have, have done their own uh, testing with, with lending live on, on mainnet to, 
like have a, have some really nice interfaces for people to actually take out loans with. Uh, it, yeah, and in addition to that, coordinate like the the messaging because. Like I said, everyone's going to want to scream from the rooftops when it's live. But if we do that and then lending isn't in like a ready to go state where people are ready to actually, you know, take a loan out, then there's really no point in us saying like, hey, it's live, but like it's not usable. So by separating out the, the launch into like these two different phases of the soft launch and, and the hard launch, uh, we, we can coordinate better on actually getting the, the correct messaging out there and uh, you know, just coordinating on like the whole like marketing end of things and actually like letting people know the protocol is live. Cause if we waste all of our firepower on lending being live, but, but capped, it seems kind of like a waste to me. We only, we only really get one, one shot at launching the lending protocol. So uh, it, having as much coordination as possible, I think would be really desirable. We get, we, you know, we, we set a date. That's when all the, uh, all, all the front ends start, start pushing it out. And then, you know, people can start tweeting about it and, and things like that. And we, we make uh, all the, all the community outreach that, that we can, but making all the noise before it's really in a usable state and ready to go. Just, you know, it, that, I don't think that's the kind of lending launch uh, that we want to let everyone know. And then it's like, all right, yeah, well you can take yeah. a thousand percent CR loan. Well, it's like, all right, well, it's going to close that the makes page sense. and yeah. never come back. And like for ThorSwap and other interfaces, that'll give us time to really like dial in the UI and really dial in the, the messaging and the education and all of that around it. Like maybe ThorSwap can have it up as like even have like a beta tag on it or something like that or put it under like advanced mode or something like that for the for the early stages. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure um, that interfaces yeah. will be launched before, and they should be launched beforehand to like actually test them and ma- make sure that like everything is, is good with that. But like, yeah, it, the, the whole point is to make sure everything's like polished. Because if things aren't ready to go, ready to go, then it's not going to be a good experience when we actually do the hard launch and want people to see and use the product. Like if, if it, like, even if everything is, is perfect on, on the Thor chain, which like, obviously we're, we're hoping it is with all the regression testing and, you know, stage night testing that's going to be done beforehand and, and everything. But uh yeah, the, the, it, the, the front end is what delivers the user experience. So if like the ThorSwap front end, if, if the ShapeShift front end, if the Thor wallet front end, if everybody isn't like ready to, to launch the product and they kind of do it really half-assed, that, that, that really doesn't, uh, it, it doesn't drive anything towards uh, lending itself. So yeah, we, we, we got one shot. Sure. So there's no point in not doing some coordination community-wide. Yeah. Well, ThorSwap's on it. I know the UI is being worked on right now. I'm trying to give feedback and like help that along, make sure it looks nice and clean and uh, you know simple. So, yeah, I mean, if people, if you guys, anyone have thoughts, hopes, dreams about what it should look like, what, things like that, um, definitely all ears. Yeah, it's probably going to be just as it's, and it's just as important to make sure that things are down for like tracking your position and to. Uh, like close out your position as it is to like open a loan. Cause it's like, all right, like anyone can just, you know, make a page where it's like, all right, we'll send this much and this is what you get. But then like actually delivering like a good experience of like, Hey, this is how much you have to pay right now in this coin that you specified in order to, to pay off your loan or, you know, just being just really holistic and in, in how in delivering all the information that, that is like needed to like properly inform a user of what's going on. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, just like a slight leak here, like on the, on the ThorSwap, uh, like UI, there's like the borrow tab and then there'll be like a separate, like my loans tab that has like a really nice, like portfolio overview of like your entire loan positions, even if you have like multiple on different assets and then shows like a breakdown of each one. And like, you can either deposit more withdraw. Uh, so yeah, for sure. It's not just going to be like, send your Bitcoin and maybe you'll receive a loan. <laughs> like, you know, it'll be, it'll, it'll be tight. It'll look really good and be easy to manage and all that. Yeah, the, the tough thing for the UXs on this feature, at least for now, is going to be like um, dealing with like um, the slippage of the, the double swap that occurs when you, or quadruple swap technically when you open a loan or, or, or close a loan. And so like the, the, the virtual depth of the, of the derived asset pool can shift very quickly. Even within a block, it can shift very fast. And so like 
you know, from a UI perspective, if you have a loan open and you want to close it, um, for example, um, and there's a lot of trading going on, like the volatility is high, a lot of volume passing through those pools, a lot of people are closing loans or opening the loans, whatever. Um, in order to pay back your $2,000 loan, you actually have to pay back more than that, like $2,100, $2,300, $4,000, whatever it is, depending upon the depth of the virtual pool, right? And then you also have the virtual pool, uh, that's the virtual pool of the Tor asset, and then the virtual pool of the Bitcoin asset, which is like, assuming Bitcoin's your, your collateral. So then like you, you know, you have to pay, overpay your loan, you know, we'll just call it, instead of paying back $2,000 you owe, oh, you actually end up have to, in, that, in that particular moment, you have to pay back 2,500, right? And then on your Bitcoin, you get back, instead of getting one BDC back, you get back, you know, 0.8 because of the slips that are paid because the virtual pool depths are shallow. And you can put like targets on these things so you can protect yourself from, from getting kind of like paying a higher fee than you wanted to pay. So that's not really an issue per se, but like to, to, from a UX perspective, like how do we show this to the user? It's kind of a complicated and difficult issue. So, I mean, can it be like a swap where you can kind of get like the query to show you the expected output before or like, is yes. It... Yep. Okay. That's all going to be in, in the quotes endpoint for open and closing loan. All that, I think all that information is already there, but like, it's going to be a counterintuitive thing of like, Hey, I have USDT. I'm going to pay back my loan, which I owe $2,000. But apparently, I need to, you know, do two thousand four hundred or something like this. I'm just making them random numbers now. But like, like that would be a counterintuitive thing. And then you, you know, agree to that two thousand four hundred. But then you actually needed two thousand five hundred because in the time span of when you submitted the two thousand four hundred, and the network received, you know, your your asset and processed it and all these kind of things, that the virtual depth has become even more shallow, and therefore it's not enough money to pay off the actual loan. And then, you know, what happens there and then like, you know, all that kind of stuff. Right. So it's just like, and you can get a refund, just like, just like you can get a refund on, on a, on a swap that is not able to respect the trade target that you specify that you want. It's conceptually basically identical. And so like you can get a refund and then you're confused. Like why did I get my USDC back? And, blah, 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 and like that, that's like a, it's a UX thing. That's going to be a, kind of a tricky to solve. And that is until we actually allow derived assets to be just general purpose assets. Right now it's only used by the lending protocol for accounting purposes, but it's coded in a way that we could literally flip it on tomorrow in, in a matter of speaking. And then they all become just general assets that you can just hold. So when you want to pay back your tour, you can just like swap to tour and then pay back the 2000 you need and you just paid it back rather than overpaying it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, that's really cool. And by the way, like that idea is like, it's there in part to protect the network from two scenarios. Like one is we don't want price manipulation happening. People like embellishing the Bitcoin price to be like, you know, $500,000 per coin and then opening a loan because whatever the CR is, it doesn't really matter in that scenario. They would, they would get out more than they put in and that would be price manipulation. That would be an exploit on the next work on the network. You know, the, the protocol would lose in that scenario, which is not good. And so, like, we do this to protect the network from, you know, attacks, but we also do it to protect the network from, like, bank runs. So in a scenario where a bunch of people are trying to close their loans because they're panicking or whatever the hell's happening in the market, some sort of flood events occurring, whatever the hell it is, like, everybody might, everybody can leave for the door if they want to, and it's up to you if you want to leave at any particular time. But if you leave during a time when everybody's leaving, then the fees are going to be a lot, lar a lot longer, a larger. So the amount that you're going to have to pay back to pay back the loan and the amount that you're going to get back when you get back your collateral would be more money to pay the down loan to get less of your collateral back. Right. And that's, you know, there to help create an incentive to have people chill the fuck out when there's some sort of like fun event happening. And just like, you know, by tomorrow, the whole thing's probably a non-issue. Like, like most of the time it is in crypto. <laughs> yeah. It's going to be one of the most difficult things to actually communicate on on like the front ends themselves you know what i mean like right. communicating right. like vir right. virtual depths and like hey there's a lot of volatility right now and like that might and the volatility is what actually causes the the, the rate of like what you're paying back to be lower than if there was less volatility like that uh, i'm not sure in what period it, it takes that uh uh like sample of what the volatility is but like yeah, that's the difficult thing to actually like communicate to to the user. 
Right. And That's something great. that probably can't even be solved in like a like a soft launch scenario. Like like these are just things that will, will have yeah, to yeah, be yeah. like solved as you know just a, as time progresses, things will happen, and then uh, you know brands will have to like solve their own communications issues and, and things. Yep, it, it's just going to be like it's kind of going to be a funny thing of like uh, like from a UX perspective that this creates a challenge for the UIs especially to kind of explain and understand and, and, you know, present their UI in a way that is like, makes sense and is clear and concise to the user. But like, then there's also like people who were like, who just kind of want, they want a, a centralized kind of experience, right? But a decentralized like action, like it's almost like people want like the best of both worlds. They want uh, everything good about you, about centralization and everything good about decentralization, put them all together and have this like perfect kind of baby. And like, obviously that's like completely impractical and, and, and quite ridiculous a lot of ways. It's like, I want a, I want, I want a car that can fly and also drive in a, you know, in, a, in the ocean and then also be able to go be a submarine. Yeah, everyone, everyone wants to, <laughs> everyone like, wants decentralized swaps and then everyone wants to pay the decentralized rate, you know? Yeah, yeah, time and time again. It's kind of this, yeah, it's like it's people want you know everything about everything, like all the good things about everything, and, and none of the bad things about anything, and that's just obviously not 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 practical or possible in many scenarios. And this is like one of those scenarios where it's like the UX is a challenge because of the because it needs to protect itself from from like you know at, attacks and manipulation, which you don't need to take to protect yourself in that scenario in a centralized exchange because like you have all like if anything is going wrong, then you just you can just pull the lever and like cancel everything right and like you know you got you got that kind of control so like well you don't generally have that in a decentralized scenario and so it's, it's just a little bit of a different beast and therefore there has to, there's, there's trade-offs that have to be made also give me some time to work on the lending page for the website and get get something good there i don't know if you guys have seen it recently i updated the uh homepage kind of recently there's a, a swap est- I, got, I got finally got the swap estimator up there on the homepage so it looks a little bit more like you know something like changely or change now's website a, a lot of the swap services do something like that on, on the front ends uh and if, if no one's checked it out yet def- definitely do and just give any feedback um it's been something i've been working on for a while so that's awesome by the way i'm i'm super excited to just rug changely and change now like, <laughs> like i'm super excited that like once streaming once streaming swaps launches whenever the hell that's going to be hopefully soon and, and you get you know you can get a much better swap fee for much larger size trades and then like when you compare us to changely and change now we just basically dominate almost all such situations and scenarios and so just like I'm just excited to just rug all their liquidity. <laughs> yeah, we, we already dominate change now. I, I checked uh, the other day, and we we basically uh, uh, damn, I'm forgetting numbers, sort of. But it, it was like it, it, we we dominate from like very low swap amounts, like somewhere like point point three ETH or something like that, all the way up to uh, like a, a Bitcoin to ETH swap rate, going all the way up to you know many many many, many uh, ETH, like going up to hundreds of thousands of dollars. We 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 dominate. Uh, change now pretty much every scenario uh, on at least like the the main routes that i'm looking at uh changely is a little bit different story they, they have really good rates and uh yeah it's gonna be really great to start kicking them uh out of the competition where, where we can offer the best of both worlds possibly hopefully yeah but that that's in like the bitcoin eth world yeah. right and i think streaming swap will not only be more efficient on like non like a little more shallow pools but it could even like actually give better like we could actually acquire trade volume from um one inch or uniswap right because like right now we use dex aggregation to to like swap like stables for example or whatever the hell it is uh, because it's just cheaper to do it on like one inch or something like this like door swap does this a lot for example and once streaming swaps becomes a thing like people will have an ability to do that that trade on Thorchain and do it more cheaply than you would do it like ERC20 to ERC20, do that on Thorchain versus uh, Uniswap, even though you're paying, technically you're paying two gas fees, two Ethereum gas fees instead of one. But like once you get to a certain like, you know, trade size, it starts to make more sense to do it on uh, on Thorchain side, at least from a fiscal perspective. So you're saying BSC is going to be a huge hit? 
<laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a massive hit. Yes. <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> well, we'll see. We'll see. Any uh, questions? By the way, anybody who has any questions or comments from the audience who wants to come up and uh, tell me why I'm an idiot, you're welcome to. Well, I can just do that too. That's true. Kyle, I always appreciate your your uh, idiocy comments. On <laughs> <laughs> unless anybody, unless we just want to call it quits. There's Patriot about? coming up. Okay, cool. Hey guys, can you hear me? Yep. Hey, sorry if my voice, I'm a little sick right now, so I'm sorry, I'm hard to understand. Um, my question was, I was listening to your part about going bare metal and the economic advantages. And I was looking at Thor Chain Bull. I had a minor interaction with him on Twitter. And he was saying, you know, the it's obvious if you go bare metal, you save so much money. So I was wondering if you guys had any knowledge or had your finger on the pulse or do no operators are, are they just scared to do bare metal or are they interested in it? I was wondering if you could highlight that because when I think of Thor Chain, I look for I look for reasons why Thorchain won't like succeed instead of reasons why it will succeed because I could pull those out of my ass all day. <laughs> but um, to me, it seems like the AWS economic disincentives of adding chains seems to be a big hurdle, maybe the biggest from my limited perspective. So I was wondering if if node op- node operators were interested in pursuing that. Thanks, guys. Yeah, I mean. I- to be honest, I haven't had any personal conversations with operators who were um, like thinking about switching over from AWS to um, bare metal, like privately. I've had some conversations like on the public mediums, you know, everybody else has seen more or less. Uh, my assumption is that like there isn't a lot of documentation right now. And I think that's something that Thorchain Bull was like intending to do at some point. And he talked about like releasing some documentation about like how to build a bare metal. There is some documentation out there already that people can do. Um, which is good for a specific scenario, but even that one was like it's still using a cloud provider. You just you're just paying the bare metal price, which I think is like uh, I think called Volter V U L T R or something like this, where you basically pay for a physical box. They're hosting it. They they have the they own the, the, the like the actual hardware. Like you're just renting their hardware versus AWS is more like containerization. And it's not actually relational to an actual box. Um, and so that doesn't really help people to get bare metal, bare metal, meaning that like outside of a cloud provider, right? Because technically even Volter doesn't actually allow you to, to run nodes for any chain, like Thorchain or otherwise, legally speaking, they've already have kind of said that they don't, don't support it. Um, I think the biggest hurdle is that it is, it does take a lot more, there's a larger t- uh, uh, investment to begin with, like you have to spend you know, depending upon which hardware you want to get, but like it could be anywhere between five thousand dollars to twenty thousand dollars or whatever, depending on how you want to like structure your 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 bare metal. Whether you want to do like, you know, uh, mounted volumes through a NAS of some kind. Like there's there's tons of different ways you could configure set your bare bare metal, and, and that can varying degrees of reliability and, and and cost and this kind of thing. But like, um, I think that's the first part is like there's, a, there's an initial investment of you know. You know, ten. Let's just call it ten thousand dollars or fifteen thousand dollars. Let's call it that for now. And uh, it's a bunch, a bunch of money. But then you have, you have to like get those boxes. You have to set them up in your mom's basement or something like this. Uh, make sure that you are of like you know some level of redundancy or uh, uh, reliability, like all that stuff. And it's harder to to be more reliable. You'll, you'll probably get more slashes, to be honest, if you're running bare metal than if you're running on AWS, just because the likelihood of your boxes going down or having some sort of problem is far higher because obviously AWS engineers and DevOps engineers are like way better than our nodes at running bare metal, but running physical boxes, physical servers for obvious reasons. And so like, you know, they do a really good job of it for obvious, uh, you know, as well. And, and our nodes are operators aren't as experienced in, in that regard. And so the likelihood of having more slashes are actually quite high, right? At least, at least initially until they fix all the bugs and work at all the kinks and, you know, auto recover from scenarios A, B, and C. Um, I think that's the biggest uh, 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 blocker, just the initial cost, the additional uh, technical expertise that you're required to do and, you know, and having and supporting a higher, high level of reliability. Like it's all difficult stuff. It's not something you just do 
you know, on a, on a Saturday when you're just got nothing else to do, that stuff takes months of work and effort and learning and education and running your own Kubernetes cluster. Like that's not easy. And so it, it takes time to do so. So you have to make a conscious choice to, to spend the time, money and energy to do so. Makes sense to me. Thank you for clarifying that. No worries. Anyone else want to hop up here? Whenever uh, people are done hopping up, then we can wrap up the space. Anything else you're, you guys are thinking about? Oh, you know what? There's been what some interesting interrupt? stuff. Uh, yeah, all, all this multi-chain stuff that's been going on. Uh, I'm sure you guys have, have seen that. That's actually pretty crazy. Like, uh, the, the rumors of the... I mean, I yeah. hate to be, like, spreading rumors on, like, this... Uh, this this space so like obviously I, I have no idea whether this is like legit or not but they they did suspend service to like a number of uh of chains apparently they don't have access to one of their servers or, or something which is just like absolutely crazy and uh like obviously like rumors of the the ceo's uh arrest and yeah. and y- y- <laughs> even like binance the, the, so like the, the binance people like they, they sent out like a bunch of notifications saying like if you use uh, you know, multi, uh, uh, multi-chain for any like bridging services or stuff like that. We recommend you basically just like do not anymore. Basically, after seeing what's happened to the a couple of the chains, like they're, uh, it, it's just clear that it's not really a secure service to be like leaving your your funds in and just like you know, for, like, possibly the the collapse of the next the next bridge of this era. H- who knows? Yeah. Seems seems likely at this point. I mean, I'll, honestly, like I don't know a whole lot about it. I hadn't been paying as close attention as I probably should be. But like the fact that that they like they can't reach the CEO, who is the only person apparently who has access to some of these servers, is just like I mean that, that should be. An, I mean, as a technical person, that's like an immediate red flag of like ridiculousness. Like my assumption from the description is that like there's some private keys on that box, and in order to reduce the exposure, they just the CEO has access to that box or something like this or something. This is my assumption that I'm making, like a reasonable assumption. And, and, you know, when he's unavailable for whatever reason, whether, whether you got arrested or not or whatever the fuck is happening or, or he rugged the whole thing or whatever, like, who knows? But, like, it's just, it's just like, <laughs> I think it was pretty clear from the, the immediate when I first saw Mobile Chain and any swap kind of pop out. And I looked at their, like, white paper and that kind of stuff. I'm like, this doesn't make a lick of sense. This doesn't make a lick of sense to me. <laughs> and then to see it all kind of coming down is, you know, kind of expected. Yeah, man, another one bites the dust. This is like an important thing. Though. Like, I feel like this is, what, this is what the one of the things the industry kind of misses as a whole is that, like, is that the industry, because it's retail, largely retail investors, and retail investors as a whole, you know, don't have the skill sets required to really do due diligence on a particular project. Like they don't have technical knowledge. They don't have the mathematical understanding. They don't have the, you know, marketing understanding. They don't like a lot of other things. Uh, professional VCs do because they have entire teams that they hire and, and, and develop and this kind of stuff. And, and so it's like retail, it's, it's so easy to convince retail to like put your money into this thing over here and just paint a beautiful picture that is, you know, has nothing behind it. But retail will buy on the on the pretty the pretty picture rather than the substantive like you know the due diligence of it of, of underneath of it all, and so like you know this is something I think we we're missing on the industry is that like there's so many people willing to shill so quickly some token because the picture was pretty, but so few are willing to like look at the underlying fundamentals and the design the implementation details and like does this actually make sense? Does this actually accomplish the, the task that they say? Yeah. And a lot of it's purposely like obscured by the projects the as, as well. It, like, it's like, you know, as, as someone also, who's looked yeah, into a lot yeah, of true. like different projects and, and things, just like my, myself, it, it is very difficult to find info on a lot of projects. I'm like, actually Absolutely. how things I, work I, it's I insane. Like, this, this is one, this is like one of the, the main reason why I wanted to build my my podcast called Mad Blocks is because like there's so few. Oh, people no, is, are, is this like, the, the paid like... advertisement? That's supposed to be at the beginning. <laughs> All right, sorry. Not a paid advertisement, more just like a point. <laughs> more like a point of just like it's like I, I just did a uh, an ep- recorded an episode the other day 
and, and it was about lens protocol. And, and in the process of trying to evaluate the implementation details of lens and whatever, of like how it actually functions and works, like it was actually really hard to figure out certain components of it because like I read through all of their documentation that they had on their, on their site and like they referenced something very quickly like oh this this is managed by multisig okay next topic <laughs> right and they just they did, like they kind of breeze by and and half of a sentence and like whoa whoa whoa, <laughs> whoa. Wait, how does this thing work who's hold, who's holding this thing what powers does this thing have blah, blah, blah. like it's just, it's just, it's harder to, to you know understand how it actually works because they purposely I don't know if, I don't know if lens purposely does this or not but like in general you're right like a lot of projects will purposely make it difficult to figure out how it all works right because they don't want the underbelly to be shown. Uh, I brought Juggernaut up here. Hey, what's up, man? Yeah, yeah. Um, hey, um, everyone. Um, How's it going? It, uh, it's about it, it's uh, it's about more. Uh, I'm very happy to uh, to see lending borrowing uh, uh, happening now. It's a nice uh, nice way to go. Uh, my question, my remark, it's for. Oh, Tor chain and Chad Barrett for uh, Chad, you, you are skeptical about Dash and BSC or BSC or any else. Will they bring liquidity to the TVL? This is your words. Uh, Kin like Atom or Rimpool, which is uh, ridiculous uh, considering the, the volume of, uh, of Atom. Uh, currently, a pool must be created for each network, this is perhaps what needs to be restarted. You see what I mean? Uh, the real strength of sex is being able to, to use the same BNB or it vault on layer one or, and on layer two. Is it possible to see the same on top chain in the future, not say tomorrow? In the future, in one year, two years, I don't know. And please, uh, just one thing: you think TVL first. Don't forget, forget, please, the virtuous circle you put everywhere on uh, on, on Twitter. For example, more swap means more yield, more helpers, less slippage. So. More high swaps, more yields, etc. Please don't put the cart before the horse. The engine is the swap volume. So BSC means more volume. This will be an engine, not the only one. But it's a volume. But uh, I think it can be a boost. Like a... Uh, uh, you know that you and Torchain don't like marketing, but it's a boost also. Says it. It's my opinion. Yeah, so a couple of points with that, uh, if I understand you correctly, and I hope that I do. Um, I think that it's false to make the assumption that Binance, adding Spartan Smart Chain will bring significant volume it'll definitely bring volume like it'll be you know some trades will occur obviously it will be zero but the question is is it significant volume and is that that volume significant enough to warrant the time that it takes to uh, to, to add the support to it to launch it to the cost of the nodes the cost of the dev like people don't think about the cost of the, the devs that it does to, to just to maintain these chains right and watch for changes and, and like deal with any kind of outages that those chains have and that can impact you know our safety or whatever it is like that all has a cost to it as well and so the question just becomes is is the cost worth the reward right and for me personally the answer is no at this particular moment but could change into the future uh you might think otherwise which is perfectly valid at a different viewpoint than myself of course but in and and if my project is added, added we'll find out if i was right or if i was wrong and maybe i'm right and maybe i'm wrong i don't know obviously don't really know but when it comes to the marketing thing that you mentioned like the problem that i have with the idea of that four chain should be doing marketing. And we talked about this very briefly on the, the lending uh, uh, Discord uh, stage the other day, is that like when everybody talks about marketing, 99% of the time, 
They have no idea what the fuck they're talking about when it comes to marketing. They're just like, Thorchain should do marketing, right? And it's just some sort of abstract idea. It's just like, it's like, the, it's like, in, like in the day, years before, people would say, you know, we'd solve this problem with AI. It's like, it's AI everything. Like, AI will just solve this and solve this and arbitrarily, okay, it'll just do this and whatever. Like, it's just like throwing a word and a term at everything without having any understanding of what it means to do the thing is like nonsensical, right? So if people want to see Thorchain do marketing, I don't know what they're talking about. I don't know what they want us to do. Because right now we are doing marketing right now. We are in this channel. We are talking on Twitter when there's 60, whatever the hell the number of people are in this channel right now and people come in and leave all the time. And, and like that is marketing. Having a Twitter account, having a spaces, you know, uh, integrating with partners, that is marketing, right? But like if people want us to spend money to, to pay, you know, um, uh, Bitcoin boy, a bunch of money to, sh to shill the, the room token or something like this, or like, you know, you want, should we do SEO? Is that what you're talking about? SEO? You want to do some SEO? Like, what is it here? Uh, Facebook ads? You want to start launching Facebook ads? Is that the thing you want us to Like, what is the thing that you actually want us to do? Right? I don't know if any of those things, Facebook ads, paying Bitcoin boy, like, or whatever, like, these things do not make sense to me personally, but I'm not a marketer. Like, I'm just not my field of knowledge or expertise, and I'll be happy to, to talk to somebody who is. But, like, I don't, I've seen projects do that shit in the past, Facebook ads and everything else, and it, it, it's meaningless. Like, it, it's non substantive. They can market the shit out of a shit coin all they want and, and pump the price, and it creates, in the end, some sort of pump and dump economics onto the asset, which is not you know, a good long-term perspective to have. For me, the marketing is like just having honest and genuine conversations that we do in, the, in this space, have a value proposition that, that, you know, we offer to the entire industry that nobody else can even come close to touching other than the ones that fork us. And like, and that's the marketing is just providing a value, valuable service people want to utilize. That's more like a more real way of doing marketing than trying to like pump and dump some bunch of money towards Bitcoin boy or whatever. Bitcoin boy, Bitcoin boy, whatever the fuck it guy's name is. No, I, I I definitely agree with with you, Chad, on the on the marketing point. Uh, yeah, it's like marketing is just such a broad term. It's like thrown around a lot, especially at the at the Thorchain, like you know, uh, in the Thorchain direction. But you know, there's no real like the the market. Like you know, obviously this has been said a million times, and like obviously there's people are going to disagree with this. But like the the marketing is. Uh, it, Thorchain's core customers are the are the interfaces. They're they're the front ends. Like the the, the core customer of Thorchain is like Trust Wallet, and the the, the customer is ThorSwap and Thor Wallet and XDFi. Uh, that 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 is who is primarily consuming the, the the product of like what Thorchain does, which is like swaps and LPs and and things like that. Thorchain just the back end. It by like I don't even know like honestly I don't know what to promote when it comes to Thorchain. Uh, like you know, obviously doing like interviews and podcasts, like that is like like that. That's what I gravitate most towards, just because I think it makes uh the most sense for like what Thorchain actually is, which is just this backend infrastructure. Like, yeah, there's nothing to promote where like unless we just tell everyone, hey, uh, send your Bitcoin to this address and you become a saver. That, that's not really a uh like an actionable. Thing. like go to thor go to thorswap.finance and make a swap that is like an actionable thing that someone can do and that that's not like it, the the uh obviously the, the back end is being powered by thorchain but what's being delivered is not is not thorchain you know so it's i mean it's in a very it's in a strange spot you know it's it's like it's like visa or, or mastercard you know I, I mean i guess i guess visa did or mastercard did like have commercials and things like that but that's just not really who this product is being uh delivered to in, in my opinion so yeah i mean like obviously like i'm not like opposed to like, marketing and like there's things that i'm i'm trying to do uh and and others are are doing for like at, like actually bringing like more awareness and like you know making these making like strategic partnerships and like you know bringing the name out that way but like in terms of like what to market there isn't really a a, a product that's delivered by thor chain it, itself like it's it, it's just the infra that powers other other apps so it's like uh it, it's, in a, it's in a different spot and like 
you know, a solution that fits like one exchange that ha- already has like a core audience of like, hey, we're going to market towards like Arbitrum people or something like that because we're a, we're a project on Arbitrum. Uh, we, we don't exactly have like a, a larger community to, 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 to pull from, except that, I mean, I guess like obviously the, the entire crypto native community, which is a very, very broad audience. So I, I think it's just like a, a very large question, just like, you know, like marketing in, in general. If people have specific ideas, I definitely love to hear them and love to talk to people. So uh, like, I think that's been the most effective marketing uh, for us. And it, it's definitely not like people don't know what ThorChain is. Like, uh, e- even just like cold reaching out to people, uh, plenty of people know exactly uh, what this product is, and plenty of people use it. Like, like it, it's definitely not suffering from like a lack of, uh, like, man, this is the ghost town in here. No one's making swaps. Like, you know, people are definitely using the products. I actually had some positive news on that front. I don't know if it's related to any swap or the multi-chain fiasco, but I've noticed a lot of new people come into the Telegram asking what Thor chain is and us giving us resources, me and Sam, yeah. Um, and so, you know, I think as time goes on, they say the market initially is a voting machine, you know, random popularity contest, but over time it is a weighing machine. And with all these subsequent failures of all these different DEXs, I think we're going to see new yield, new users naturally because our chain has merit. It has the foundation. It's robust. It's strong. It's open source. It has all the positive attributes that makes us so strong. So I think we're actually doing quite well. I know it's frustrating, but if anyone here, like I went to the Litecoin convention in Las Vegas with my own money, and I made a lot of good friends like Johnny Litecoin. He's a big Litecoin guy. And he actually knows of ThorChain and he actually had an LP position on ThorChain. I had no idea. So, you know, people know about us and they are using us. I think this will resolve itself in time. Is ThorChain a, like a back end? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So ThorChain is just the infrastructure that powers, you know, sw- powers swap services, powers savers that then like ShapeShift delivers and ThorSwap delivers. So, so ThorSwap is, uh, sorry, ThorChain is essentially just the, the infrastructure and the security. Like that, that is all, ThorChain is just a series of nodes that control this rotating TSS vault thing, like, and, and just how to economically secure those assets. Like that, that's all the, the, the core of ThorChain is. Uh, and is it like PayPal for crypto, bro? Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, he might yeah, I know. I, I, I agree with what pa- Patriot was saying. Like that, like market markets can be irrational, and they can be like they can always just chase the the shiny object, whatever that shiny object is, in a given moment. But like. The, the position that I've always taken, and I think the project as a whole has always taken, is that, like, let's just ship, right? Let's just create and ship really valuable, really useful uh, products that actually provide real service, right, and solve real problems for people, right? Whether that be cross-chain swaps in a decentralized way, whether it be interest on your Bitcoin, whether it be getting loans on your Bitcoin or other assets, like, all those things are, like, things that the industry has never seen before, before ThorChain did those things, and it actually creates like a significant purpose and value proposition for the, for the whole industry to consume. And so um, my hope, and, and I hope I'm not being too ideological with this, but like my hope is that over the long term, people will, you know, awaken to what ThorChain does and how it pro- provides what it provides. And all these little like, you know, bullshit, uh, fake ThorChain pro- products out there that say they do the same thing as us, but they're structured very differently, you know, and maybe any swap multi coin is an example of that, but like, it just, it just, they're all going to fail. Even like change lead and change. Now they're like, you know, they're doing centralized exchange with no KYC. How long can that survive? before Like, you know, the government comes after that. Like, I don't understand why they're even around now, but at some point they're probably going to collapse. Also like a couple other things to add to that. Um, it's definitely not like other, um, like, crypto services are like really growing in like in, in terms of like who's actually using them and like, you know, in, in terms of like new adoption, it's not like ThorChain is unique in the regard of like, Hey, uh, you know, price is going down what, what's going on. You know, it's like that, that like, that, it's really not unique to, to ThorChain, like e- even in the slightest. Uh, 
so yeah, definitely wanted to say that. Damn, there's one more thing I wanted to say. And oh yeah, it was the yeah, actual performance of like the TBL, the network versus other major DEXs, e- even in like, you know, the past couple of months, which have obviously been like, you know, a, a decrease in, in volatility, decrease in like token prices and, and things. Uh, Thorchain does a lot better than almost, and then all, all the competition, like almost, uh, almost always, and definitely in in all the largest protocols, which we definitely track and we talk about. Uh, I, I can't I can't remember exactly the uh, like the month on month stats, but um, we, we the discount frequently posts like you know how much like TBL there is, and just comparing them month on month to other DeFi protocols, you'll see that the performance is like very similar and usually thorchain is either like either either losing less or gaining more uh, in terms of like uh total total number of assets on the network so just like just something to keep in mind that uh you know no, nothing develops in a vacuum and everything is very very connected in, in this space and let's uh yeah let's go to uh end and then we can close it out and if Finley wants to come up again Hey guys, I just had a, I just had a question. Um, so I see that recently there's like a lot of hype um, from chain to chain. It's not like before where everything is hyped up, but we see like these sporadic like manias that happen in certain new chains that launch. Like for example, Pulse Chain had a new one, and I see a lot of talk about like Radix. I was just wondering, does the team have any plans to like? capture that energy like maybe have the swaps ready for that chain what when it launches or close to its launch so we kind of capture it as third chain because i feel like there's hype and that kind of goes away but i feel like if we capture that a lot of people will turn into wait a minute this third chain is a lot better than what they're doing you know it might attract a lot of more investors well, the short answer is no. And the reason why that is is because the act of adding a new chain, like take Radix, for example, um, Radix is like not a fork of Bitcoin. It's not a fork of Ethereum. It's an entirely new structure about how you a blockchain is built. And therefore, they get the technical <coughs> cost to actually support such a thing that's actually quite high. Um, not to mention that, that the, the biz dev aspect to it of forming a relationship and, and like getting – you know, the pe- people behind the project, the community behind the project could be like supportive of Thorchain and, and do some co-marketing, adding some liquidity to the pool when it launches, you know, all this kind of stuff, integrating to their wallets, their their indexes, like all that kind of stuff. But that's a, all those things are very long tail processes and they take many, many months, a lot longer than these kind of like, you know, flash in the pan scenarios. But I also say, even if we had the ability to add those flash in the pan scenarios and quickly add Radix or quickly add this thing, because it's it's like, pumping for some reason or whatever like that's not really a line in my viewpoint of like how we should like we i don't want thorchain to be chasing the pumps and the dumps in a sense i don't want to try to catch a falling knife in a matter of speaking and, and try to figure out what one's going to pump next or whatever like that's just like that's just like chasing unicorns and this kind of thing it just seems like a complete waste of time and energy instead i have the viewpoint this is my viewpoint of the viewpoint of, of the product or or the community as a whole but just that I want to look at the fundamentals, look at what look at what would actually would benefit the project over a long period of time, you know, and, and be a, a long term partner rather than a short term flash in the pan, right? And I think that's the viewpoint that I have, and so I wouldn't advocate to add Radix just because they're you know getting a lot of engagement all of a sudden or their prices pumping for some reason. I would say I, I I I'd be open to adding Radix because I I know the the the, the CEO of Radix personally and. and and he's a big fan of Thorchain and his whole team is really a big fan of Thorchain. And so like, and they have a really difficult time getting listed on exchanges because they're such a different protocol than a fork of Bitcoin, like I mentioned. And so it's very hard for them to get listed on, on an exchange like Binance or whatever. And so we can provide really good valuable service for that particular community. And that particular community would be very you know appreciative of that thing and, and really engage and add liquidity and trade through the R network, blah, 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 like all that stuff. And so I'd be interested in RedX because I feel like they would be you know, a really good partner um, in many ways, not so much because of the coin might be pumping or whatever. Uh, Finblit, what's up, man? 
Hey guys, I just wanted to circle back to the marketing thing real quick. You know, I, I was thinking about recently the fact that, you know, Thorchain has about $30 million in single sided savers deposits right now. <clears throat> and some of the, you know, companies that no longer exist that were centralized that were doing this, like BlockFi, Celsius, Voyager, they had billions, right? So they were 50x, you know, larger than, than uh, Thorchain. And as, and, and you know, I, it always mystified me how they got so how they got so large, right? The only place I ever heard BlockFi mentioned, I think, was when I listened to a couple of Anthony Pompliano's podcasts. Um, and so I'd, I'd be curious: has anyone ever tried to reach out to like people from the marketing department at BlockFi or Celsius, or tried to figure out what marketing firms they use just to have a conversation and be like, "Hey, what did you guys do? Was it just you know sponsoring guys like Pompliano, or were there other?" other methods because there's there's got to be some secret sauce there that uh that some of those companies used and who knows maybe some really good marketing people looking for some uh some consulting work or something like that yeah you got to know the guy who uh who runs the canadian pension fund <laughs> you've heard you've heard gerald talk there. <laughs> yeah sorry it's the joke uh uh, so I, I've never talked to the marketing. I mean, I've talked to the guys over there, blocked by a few times and had conversations with them in the past, but like, I've never had the conversation about specifically marketing. My, my assumption like of why they grew so big so fast is because, um, because they're centralized, they can attract a different type of customer that is more difficult for us to attract. And that's largely like institutions, right? Um, and larger like whales and that kind of stuff because they like to have a, a personal connection with the person and that kind of stuff. I think that was where they gave them the advantage more than anything else. And also being like having a, a board of directors and like I think Anthony Pompliano was actually one of the board, the members of their board, if I remember correctly. Uh, and Anthony Pompliano, you know, is you know one of the largest voices in, in the Bitcoin community, you know, by a good margin, like him and a handful of other people like Carter and, um, you know, uh, Eric Borges is one of them and you know other people as well and so like I think that's really what it was more than anything else is their and their connections to uh, large institutions and personal relationships in that case that's my assumption what it is I could be completely wrong and you know that, that would be fine of course uh, but I think for us if we have a different kind of task at hand than what they had and it's a different it's a different road to walk down even though if we're providing this kind of the same product like interest on your Bitcoin but the road we take is very different because we're decentralized and they're centralized. Maybe. I mean, you know, certainly a, a large portion of their customer base was industrial or institutional, sorry. Um, but they definitely had a hell of a lot of retail as well. You can kind of tell from some of the noise about the bankruptcy on, on crypto Twitter, et cetera. Um, and I, I, I still think it would be just worth, you know, nine realms or somebody from the community who, who's got an in just trying to talk to some of some of those defunct companies marketing departments just to see like just to just to confirm like are, are you right was it mostly institutional and and because they were centralized or or was there a lot of organic retail outreach that that worked that could you know pivot pretty neatly to uh uh to a decentralized protocol like like Thorchain. I mean, I think the other thing that that they had going for them is, was that um, they didn't have a quote shit token, right? Like Anthony Papiano and uh, that guy from like what Bitcoin did, I can't remember his name right now. Like they were all big advocates for for BlockFi and and talking about it. And a lot of Bitcoin maxis or, or hardcore Bitcoiners, you know, for a lot of them they may not want to put their your, their their precious sats into you know Thorchain because it's a shit coin and it's going to go to zero and blah, 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 and they're going to lose all their Bitcoin. Like that kind of mentality is something that they uh, they didn't have for BlockFi, but they had it for Thorchain, which is kind of comedic because <laughs> BlockFi and all those guys completely collapsed and they lost their Bitcoin. But like, I shouldn't be laughing about that. That's actually a terrible thing. But like it, the irony of the, the irony of that is, is kind of uh, obviously comical. But like, you know, we're still around. We still provide what we provide. And, and maybe because of their collapses, they'll be more open to it. I don't know. But like that's Bitcoiners are oftentimes maxis. And so like it's harder to get them to put their Bitcoin into something that has a shit coin behind it, quote unquote. True. But those those companies also had a lot of deposits, you know, of cryptos other than, than Bitcoin. They had a crap ton of Ethereum and uh, 
and you know a lot of you know what are probably truly shit coins as well true true that, that, that's fair, fair yeah. I mean, yeah you make a good point i'm definitely gonna at least i'm gonna take some kind of look into this uh and if anyone else has any info about this then let me know because i'm i'm definitely curious uh to learn i i mean it's, it's a good approach for sure to like uh, you know, just see how others are doing things. Because uh, they're, they're like, I'm sure there will be companies built on top of ThorChain that that are essentially BlockFi, basically offering, uh, you know, the Sabres product and LP products and delivering it in, in a similar way. And like, they're going to go through a similar like product cycle and like marketing uh, engagement as, as like BlockFi or Celsius. So like, I definitely think taking a look at like where where they really succeeded, which is obviously like getting getting the product like really out there and front and center, and like obviously everyone knew what they were uh, is like a really good approach. So yeah, no, thanks for bringing that up. Actually, cool, appreciate it, guys. Also, just uh, don't forget that you know what you've built so far has better savings rates than anything those guys ever offered too, which is pretty fantastic. Hundred percent, but we'll see after this uh, vote <laughs> on, on on one eleven about Sabres yield. What's going to happen with that? It'll, if it gets approved, it'll it'll drop for sure. Yeah. Uh, cool. Should we wrap it up then? It's been like two hours. Yeah, let's wrap it up unless anybody else has any questions or anything. I think we're good to go. All right. Sounds good. Well, yeah, right, let's, uh, let, let's do this. And I, will, I guess we'll do this time for the for the time being on, on Thursdays at 6 p.m. Eastern uh, just to accommodate chat here. So we'll, uh, this will be the tentative time <laughs> for, from now on. But we'll, we'll be obviously keep tweeting out like when it's going to happen. We got to we got to we got to accommodate for chat the row here. It's always, he's just always a problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's all. It's Ch- all Chad has never all, been a problem. It's one. Chad that's been a problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Chad's take the fall for Chad's. It's just what Chad's do, I guess. But <laughs> <laughs> but um, we do have a. There is a Thor swap space tomorrow. If anyone wants to to check that out, since since this one went to Thursday, uh, we 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 swapped the Thor swap ones to Friday. So did a little trade, but. Cool. That's scheduled if people if people haven't got quite enough of their their Thor chain fix already. Nice, and actually, it, this kind of works out better because uh, you know, obviously, the etymology of Thursday is it being Thor's day. So now that we're doing the the podcast on Thor's day, it's just it seems more appropriate. So we got there. I, I actually kind of like that. It's actually pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, well, all right. Sounds good, guys. Uh, let's wrap it up. Peace. All right. See you guys. Later.